everybody, my name is Rennie, my pronouns are they, them, and this is Rennie Reads. Here on my channel we talk about queer books, fan fiction, human rights, and just about everything in between. Today's book is The Honeys by Ryan LaSala. I read it as an audiobook. The person who read it, his name is Pete Cross. It was, it was amazing. I love this book. <laughs> anyway, let's get into it. Alright, so The Honeys was published in 2022. Like I said, I listened to the audiobook version of it and same as Anna Greenville because it is so new. I wasn't able to find a PDF version that I wouldn't have had to pay for, so I don't have any screenshots of any quotes or anything, unfortunately. I do have a bunch of books on my desk over there that I will be reading. They're from the library, they're the physical copies, so hopefully the next video I put up I will have like pictures and stuff for you, but... This book was incredible. Um, it is a horror book. I did not know that going into it. I didn't do any research on the book beforehand. I kind of pulled up my library rental app and looked at what was available in the LGBTQ audiobook section, found this one, looked interesting, and it's a horror book so please be aware going into it. I'm gonna give a bunch of trigger warnings for it. So, getting into those. The trigger warnings for this book are character death, body horror, bullying, transphobia, homophobia, misogyny, and neglect. Okay, so the queer themes in this book. Our main character is Mars. They are gender fluid. Uh, they use all pronouns, so he, she, they, them, she, her, all that good stuff. Um, I He was mostly referenced as he in the book. I'm going to try and oscillate between pronouns, but the pronouns used in the book for Mars was mostly like he, him. So that's probably what I'm going to be using the most of. So Mars is gender fluid. It's stated in the very beginning um, that he kind of identifies more with a feminine side. Him and his twin sister Caroline, a lot of times it's said that they switch clothes and stuff. So that's our queer rep in this book. It is a prominent thing. This story is more focusing on what happens to Mars more so than Mars's queer experience, I guess. The book is less of a coming of age story and more of just like straight up f shit. It's, it's so good. But anyway, okay, getting into the book. So it starts out very violently, very quickly. Uh, with Caroline, Mars's twin sister, climbing up through the window off the balcony of their house and trying to smash his face in with a sundial that she had gifted him earlier that year. So immediate struggle. They Mars like throws her off of him and they end up in the hallway. They're like struggling in the hallway and Caroline falls down the stairs and their father is down at the bottom of the stairs and she like lunges at him and attacks him and so he kind of like tosses her off and she just goes right back straight for Mars and they fall against the banister and they both fall off the banister into the chandelier and she ends up landing beneath Mars and she dies. She doesn't die right away, she ends up going into a coma and at the hospital the parents have to choose to take her off of life support. and. They do like an autopsy on her. Um, Mars and Caroline's parents are rich. Their mom is a senator and their dad is, he also does something within the government, I believe, but they're, they're rich. So they have money to do an autopsy and it's found that she had a brain tumor in the part of the brain that alters personality. So her aggression is attributed to that. However, but I have my doubts. <laughs> so they hold a funeral. It's a family tradition to hold the funeral in the house, specifically in like the main area and the viewing room is off in the parlor. So Mars stays away from the parlor half the time. He's put on greeting duty. So he greets all of the guests and stuff like that. And he kind of has to like pull it together almost he before the like ceremony he has like long hair like longer than my hair um and he shaves it off and he puts on caroline's makeup and just kind of like that's his front that's his armor for for the whole event there's this summer camp that they that caroline specifically religiously goes to every single summer and she's 
got these friends who show up who they weren't exactly invited but they show up anyway and their names are Bria, Sierra, and Mimi and these three girls there's just something off about them. They're from a cabin, all, all four of them, including Caroline, was from, they are from this cabin called Cabin H. And there's like a little bit of a dark history with that cabin at the summer camp. Um, the summer camp is called Aspen. It's for a lot of really rich kids in like rich families, very affluent families and stuff like that. So it's summer camp, but it's bougie summer camp. But these girls are from Cabin H and they're called the Honeys because they're the ones who do all of the beekeeping at the camp and you know they're off to the side of this in this like little secluded cabin originally the cabin had been for scholarship kids so it was more of a class difference of like we're going to keep the poor kids over there but as time had gone on it was just like less there were no more scholarship kids and you know it was these girls the honeys and so three of these girls bria sierra and mimi come to the funeral and immediately Mars was a little skeptical of them. He was very jealous because his sister had been pulling away from him as they grew up because she was getting a lot of pressure put on her by their parents to just live up to the example of, you know, like she was going to follow in her mother's footsteps and be like in a place of power and stuff like that. And Mars was kind of the unspoken disappointment of the family um, because they were gender fluid. They were just like the little dirty family secret almost and so there were no expectations placed on Mars. It was all placed on Caroline. And so immediately these girls come in and Mars is just kind of wary because he had always wanted to fit in with these girls. He'd always wanted like a group of people that he could love as much as Caroline seemed to really love these girls because every single time she'd come home from camp she would try and tell Mars all about them and all about the honeys and stuff like that and he just kind of tuned it out. He was like I don't want to listen to this because he wasn't a part of it. But they're very sweet. There is something a little bit off about them he notices. They seem to kind of speak as one. They don't speak in the same sentence but they do finish each other's sentences and they speak in the same mind like wavelength. So he notices there's, it's, they're just a little off and he's like, well, I don't know if this is just like uniquely a girl thing or if this is something that, you know, is just them, kind of. They're hanging out here. They, they offer their condolences and they say, hey, you know, we know you went to Aspen a really long time ago and we would love if you would come in Caroline, Caroline's place because she had her entire year paid out or that like summer paid out, but she'd only been at the, at the, camp for one week before she came home and tried to murder her sibling um and ultimately died but um they're like we would love it if you would come and you know just like memorialize Caroline through you and to just try it out again you know things have changed since you've been there and we would just really think it would be good for you to go like we want you there and Mars is just like okay sure like I'm in the middle of grieving for my twin sister but you know I guess I'll just think about this camp whatever and you know he just kind of puts it aside but at one point during the cer like the ceremony the celebration of life he gets into a little bit of an argument with his mom because his mom and his dad don't really seem to give a crap about him very much so he tries to be like well, you know, I don't know that this is what Caroline would have wanted, indicating like the celebration of life with all of these stuffy other senators and rich people and stuff. And, you know, his mom is just like brushing it off and, and she implies too that she wants him to leave. Like she's like, oh, you should go down to the drugstore down the street and get more ice. And he's like, well, why don't you just send dad to go get more ice? And she just kind of like pauses and he realizes, oh, she wants me to leave. So she, he's like, no, never mind, like whatever. And so he goes to the parlor where Caroline is and just kind of like takes some time with her. And then he goes out to the garden that's off of the parlor. And he's sitting in the bushes. They used to go and like have their own little parties in the bushes when she was alive and when they were younger, they would, while all the adults were having like these socials and stuff like that, he would, he and Caroline would go outside and, you know, they would steal some snacks and stuff and, you know, listen to the music and create their own stuff together. And he goes and he's just reminiscing from that. 
and then he looks up because there's some movement in the room with Caroline and he sees Sierra, Bria, and Mimi in the room with her and Bria takes out her earrings they're, they're like these little bee charms and she takes out her earrings and she puts them on Caroline but Caroline doesn't have pierced ears <laughs> so she puts them on Caroline and they stand there for a minute and then they walk away and then they leave the party and Mars is like what did they just do to my sister so he goes back inside to check it out and sure enough uh, Bria had pierced Caroline's ears and so he leans in to kind of look closer to see if you know he's like is there any blood or anything like is there anything I need to clean up and so he leans closer and a bee comes out of her head and this is where the body horror starts so if like tripop phobia like holes and stuff and like insects are not your thing this really isn't gonna be your thing um and this is also where I realized it was a horror book because up until then I was like oh it's just like some kid who's grieving his sister and like stuff like that and no <laughs> no <laughs> um but yeah so a bee comes out of her head and like flies around and Mars is like swatting at it they're just like freaking out and when more people are drawn to the room to see what Mars is freaking out about, the bee disappears back into her head. And he's immediately like, okay, I need to figure out what the heck these girls did. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna go to Aspen then. I'm gonna go back to the old stomping ground and I'm gonna take Caroline's place and we're just gonna do that and figure out what the hell happened to my sister. Because at this point, he's like, okay, well they say brain tumor, but there's a bee in her head so I don't know that it was brain tumor so he goes to his parents once the funeral's done and it's like a day later he's like I'm going to Aspen and they're like are you sure and you know they're like yes I'm sure I'm I'm going to Aspen so that's exactly what happens so the reason that Mars didn't end up staying at Aspen was because one of the years, I think about three or four years prior, Mars is 17 in this. Mars and Caroline both. Um, but I think a few years prior, early teens, stuff like that, Mars had come out as gender fluid at the camp, like to other people. He, he was being like open about it and stuff like that and it's a very misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, it's very old rigid gender roles. and. So these three boys took issue with it and there was this like competition called the Battle of the Sexes and Mars wanted to play on the girls side and they weren't going to let that happen and these three boys also were like okay well, we're not going to let that happen and we're not going to let you get away with it. So there was this huge scoreboard on one side of a field where all the games were supposed to take place and they tied Mars to the scoreboard lit some kindling on fire and left him to die like a burning witch basically and Wendy the camp coordinator um once like he he managed to get out he managed to like loosen himself and like run away and stuff but Wendy the camp coordinator um didn't do anything about it They just kind of swept it under the rug and was like, oh, so sorry about that. Like, here's a free year for your other child for a scholarship to come for free. And, you know, nothing really ever got done. And Mars's parents really don't seem to care. Like, if it's not Caroline, they don't really care. So, yeah, it, it he, he was like, I'm never going to Aspen again. Like, never, ever. But now that, you know, a bee flew out of their sister's head, um, they're going back to Aspen. Yeah, so upon arrival to Aspen, it's very culty immediately. And it's it's framed as being like this because it's an old high society kind of thing. Like same families for generations, stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of symbolism. Um, you know, there's a lot of like one organism symbolism with, it's called Aspen because of all the Aspen trees. And Aspen trees are one big organism. It's just one big copy of the same tree. And once the original tree dies, the whole forest dies and then it regenerates. So there's already that. And then there's, of course, the honeys with, you know, the apiary and, you know, all the honey hives, the hives and stuff like that. And, um, 
you know, that being like one big hive, one big organism. And there's also like the camp code, which is really culty in itself. I wasn't able to find the whole camp code. Um, I tried to sift through like a few hours of the audiobook when I was finished, but I only wrote down this one part. Um, and part of the camp code is we came as one and left as many. We came with nothing and left with everything. Aspen now and forevermore. And so immediately it's just like, Ugh, that's not good. <laughs> not good vibes. Also, immediately Mars starts getting bullied. Um, you know, there's a tradition with the older boys specifically and the older girls they've been roped into it now too um, but they go and they play flashlight tag in the first couple of weeks and so Wendy the camp like the the camp overseer director she assigns her nephew Wyatt to Mars and this immediately puts a target on Mars's back um, and Wyatt is very like trying to be friendly and stuff, but it's very clear that Wyatt is not only there to keep an eye on Mars, but also to play damage control when Mars inevitably gets, like, caught up in something. Because Mars is a little combative, um, but also, like, he does stand up for himself, and that's just kind of not really tolerated, I guess. The camp rules regarding interpersonal like derision and arguments and stuff is that once you have done your due diligence to try and work it out with the other person then you can escalate to like a camp counselor and stuff like that. I just that's where the neglect part comes in where you know a lot of really bad things happen and nothing's really done. So a couple instances they play flashlight tag as like the big kid groups and there was this guy I think his name was Callum um, there was this guy who was just being really homophobic to Mars, and so Mars made, like, the classic, like, oh, I fucked your dad kind of, like, thing, um, and Callum took that personally. So during flashlight tag, this kid, like, corners Mars and just beats the shit out of him, and is probably, like, beating him within an inch of his life. It's very graphic. Another time is when there's this, like, excursion they go on. It's, like, this three-day hike, and during it, there's, like, this initiation. Their, their cabin is called, like, the Bear Lodge, the one that Mars is in. It's all boys. Uh, it's called the Bear Lodge, and, you know, in order to be initiated into this Bear Lodge, they it's it's so much they put like hoods over the kids in the dead of night hoods over these kids and they like put them in the middle of the woods and they're like here's a flashlight you have to stay here till you count to it's i think it's like 1943 or something like that because that's when aspen was founded and once you've counted that you have to take off the hood and then find your way back to camp and you're only you're not allowed to speak or anything and the flashlight is all you get. While Mars is doing this, one, his flashlight has no batteries, so he has no light, and then while he's trying to find his way back, he stumbles, he, he's just like, also during this he's having a lot of like visions almost, a lot of nightmares and stuff, and he's not really able to parse it from reality. So not only is he seeing his sister dying over and over again in his dreams, He's also now in the woods, dark, and all of a sudden there's just this horrible audio of his sister like screaming and crying and he doesn't know where it's coming from. And before Caroline died, she put her hive tool from the apiary, from the honeys, next to his bed. And it's like this sharp object. I'm gonna have Tegan put like a picture of it on the screen. It's, it's like, it's pretty sharp, all things considered, because it's meant to take the wax cappings off of, you know, honeycomb and stuff like that. And just like pry pieces of the hive out for like inspection and stuff. And he has this at, on him at all times and he finds a speaker that is playing the sounds of his sister like screaming and crying and he goes to like pick it up and see it but it it stops and it says bluetooth disconnected and then a, a, like a shadowy figure like runs out from the trees and so he hucks the hive tool and it catches the person in the back and he runs after them thinking oh great i've felt them i can like expose them basically and nothing happens the person's not there anymore but the hive tool is and it's bloody 
So he picks up the hive tool, wipes it down, and he's like, okay, I have to like tell people about this. And then of course when he tells not only his main camp counselor, but also the director, Wendy, they're like, well, we think you're, you know, like troubled because your sister just died and also you've caused us problems in the past. So this is obviously just you causing problems again. And, you know, Mars is like, okay, great. Thanks for nothing. And he also threatens them like, oh, I'm sure you don't want a liability on your hands. Like the statute of limitations for neglect and like child endangerment is five years and it's only been four years since, you know, somebody tried to burn me at the stake. You know, I'm sure you don't want a lawsuit on your hands. I looked at your, your files. He's also very nosy, but he's like, I looked at your files and you're about two campers away from the red. So I would think very carefully about your actions. And, you know, just kind of walks out. Also, his things start going missing. His sister also left a candle with his name imprinted on it. It's a beeswax candle that it looks like she made before she died. And it has his name stamped on the side of it and it's gone. It's just missing. Um, and before this, before it had been missing, somebody had lit it and left it on his bed. And so, like, people are not only using it, but also they took it from him. So that's fun. But also, while all this is happening, the honeys seem to just be there at every single turn. Bria specifically. Yeah, so Bria and Sierra and Mimi specifically are there when the Callum is beating the crap out of him during flashlight tag and they he registers that they're there he can like hear their voices and recognize their voices but he describes it as like their images are buzzing like he can't make out exactly who the person is because their image is buzzing and these girls just have like a series of things that are just off not only you know did they do that weird thing with, you know, the earrings? There's just a lot of other stuff. And it's not just Bria, Sierra, and Mimi. There's like a whole group of them. It's a whole cabin's worth of girls. So they're all just off. And, you know, when Callum is beating the crap out of this kid, uh, out of Mars, they start hurting him. But they're not touching him. The, he just, like, ends up really bloodied and bruised and, like, also within an inch of his life. One of them, I believe it might have been Mimi, um, but she was like, oh, do we just kill him? I, like, so, so, like, nonchalantly. And Bria's like, oh my god, Mimi, no, like, we're not gonna kill him, you know? He didn't kill Mars, so we're not gonna kill him. But also, after this, and after a few other instances in the book as well, they erase their memory, like Mars and Mars's bully, they erase their memory and they replace it with something different. Like Callum remembers that he slipped and fell. Like he was he was chasing after Mars to like tag him in the game and he slipped and fell. And Mars just remembers also falling because you know he's all beat up and stuff now too. Um, but he remembers also falling. They're also really violent. They also seem to be able to read Mars's mind. Not in like the exact sense of like, oh, he's thinking something and they're like reading it. They just seem to really be able to read what he's thinking or like the same path that he's thinking on. And uh, so like during some of their conversations, Bria specifically, she, she, bleh, she seems to be like the leader of them. She will bring up specific things that Mars is like, I don't know how you thought, I, how you figured out I was thinking that. And they do, like I, like I mentioned earlier, you know, at the funeral, they seem to speak as one. They seem to operate as one. It's very hive minded. <laughs> they seem to always be on the same wavelength. So Mars oscillates between trusting them because they do tend to speak up for him and like help him. And they're very welcoming to him, um, especially because Caroline was so close to, to them um you know mars is just like desperate for this connection to the people who knew caroline especially right before she died so he really tries to connect with them but then they'll do things that are just off or weird even though every single time something happens and then the honeys do that weird like buzzing image thing or they hurt somebody in front of him or they talk about something that you know he shouldn't know every single time they wipe his memory it it doesn't stick. Like Mars is able to just break free of it and realize they're lying to me. What are they lying to me about? So every single time he falls back into trust with them, it doesn't 
stick around for very long. So Brayden is the camp counselor of the bear cabin, like the head cabin. So it's like it's like Brayden and then Wyatt and then a couple of other people and then all the boys um, and Mars. Wyatt's still sticking around. He's still wandering after Mars every chance he can get. But Brayden specifically goes missing. And this is right after one of the girls in the camp. She was just like a regular camp counselor. She kind of gets recruited into the honeys and something happens with her and you know she, she it's very obvious that she's in distress. Mars stumbles upon her crying behind the boathouse and she's like she doesn't talk about it obviously because they don't know everybody but immediately after that the honeys kind of recruit her and right after this they had like a festival and the honeys are the dancers of the place. So they they perform a dance and Sylv is it's the first time that Sylv is dancing with them. You can just tell that something is wrong and like she's just not feeling too hot and whatever and Brayden is just being a conniving little asshole. I think we can all figure out what happened but um it is explicitly like talked about later on in the book too but yeah Brayden goes missing though Brayden goes missing he so Mars sneaks out one night to kind of he's got a suspicion about the honeys being linked to a bunch of missing people in the area because specifically Sierra goes missing and not only does Sierra go missing but nobody seems to remember her except for the honeys and him so he goes to the honeys and he's like who's Sierra because he remembers her but he doesn't remember like who she is and as she, as he's like talking to the honeys he remembers who Sierra is and that like she was really kind to him uh, she painted his nails with Caroline's old polish that she used to wear all the time and they just like cried together in the honey cabin the cabin H um, and so like he's like I remember this person is very significant to me but I don't remember where they are or what happened and it's revealed that Sierra died. Um, something chased Sierra into the woods and off a cliff and she died a lot like Caroline did by falling. But nobody remembers her and like the whole camp consensus is nobody knows who Sierra is. There is no record of her anywhere and you know now that Mars remembers her the honeys again try to wipe his memory and he remembers again and he's like, no, I think they have something to do with all the missing people around here. So once again, he goes from trusting the honeys to not trusting the honeys. And Wyatt is in denial about Aspen in general because obviously if a person went missing and nobody remembers, not only are the honeys probably involved, but Aspen is probably covering for them because a whole person just cannot go missing under the care of something like somebody's gonna remember her. So Wyatt is the nephew of the camp director and his family has been camp director and camp owner for generations so he's just kind of like got a hard on for this place he's very loyal. So Wyatt is just following after Mars he's also very curious about like what is happening but he's trying to convince Mars also that like he's crazy and you know like they just need to bring this to Wendy the camp director and like everything will be all smoothed over the over and whatever and Mars is like no and trying to like get past him he made like this huge spreadsheet of people who went missing in the vicinity of Aspen or just like people who attended Aspen and then later in life went missing. Wyatt is like well that sucks that you made this and are going to all this effort but I told Brayden and Brayden's gonna go tell Wendy and you're gonna be sent home. Except that Brayden has gone missing. Nobody can find him. Um, he goes out in the night because this is at like 2 a.m. when Mars sneaks out and makes this spreadsheet and looks up all these people. Brayden went to Wendy's but he doesn't come back and the next day there's this they're putting on this huge jubilee as like kind of a it's like a parent teacher conference kind of thing except also showing off the camp to like prospecting families and stuff. So the kids are all showing off and stuff and the next day nobody can find him and Wyatt is doing all of his like chores and stuff. What's weird too is that people start forgetting about Brayden. Like every other person Mars will be like hey like have you seen Brayden and every other person was like either oh no I haven't like that's weird and then a couple of people are like who's Brayden even though that's their camp counselor and he's been around for years at this camp um so Wyatt is like okay like I admit something's weird something weird is going on 
maybe the honeys have something to do with it. And Mars is like, okay, that seems like a likely source. Like, I remember them doing a lot of really weird things, or I remember them taking away memories that I don't have anymore. So that's like, that sounds pretty, like, plausible. So they go to cabin H and they find back behind all the beehives, there's the shed that nobody except for the girls are allowed to go into. And behind the shed is a path. At first, Mars is like, well, where does this lead? And why it's like nowhere, it just kind of leads to like an, a swampy area. There's really nothing back there. But they go and they follow it and they find an old abandoned hotel. And they go into this hotel and the vibes are off. The vibes are bad. Um, and there's just like, when, when they step in, Mars can just hear bees, but he cannot see the bees. And he's like, okay. So they wander around a little bit in the upstairs part and like the main level and they find this huge chimney that's like attached to this huge fireplace and there's honeycomb in it and it's like going downwards. Wyatt is like well bees like warmth and you know they try they burrow too so they go down to the basement and they find Brayden. Um, he is encased in honeycomb. He is like gold like his skin is gold, his eyes are gold, his hair is gold, he's covered in honey. The honey is mostly blood at this point and when they go to try and pull him out of the honeycomb and like take him away he just like melts basically. He, he falls apart and turns into like it's it's gross. It, bleh. Um, but he, he falls apart and just kind of becomes one with the honey. He just dies. And of course the bees are very angry because they've taken away their meal and so they're getting stung all the way back to the place. They manage not to get caught by the honeys but you know things just kind of progress after that. During the like they call it the summer jubilee the like show and tell thing for all the parents it's called the summer jubilee and then the day after all of the like after they find Brayden and stuff they go to the summer jubilee and there's this farmer's market and Mars ends up finding on accident because he's trying to get out of the the like farmer's market but he finds on accident the honeys and they're selling honey and like beeswax products and stuff. He sees them and he knows that they know that he's there so like they can kind of like sense each other together and he watches Bria sell a lady a jar of honey that is as red as blood and he knows immediately that that is Brayden's blood and he just freaks out and like books it and like runs away but before he can get very far there are these boys who stop him and there's some of the boys in his cabin but they have like bees in their ears and they don't seem to hear him and they stop him and they knock him out and when he wakes up he wakes up in the middle of the woods at this huge table. It's not really a table, it's a fallen log, but it's been smoothed off to be a table. And there's like all this charcuterie and stuff and all, there are all the honeys sitting around the table. And Bria's at the head of the table and Mars is at the other side of the table. And she's like, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. And he's like, yeah, I have a lot of questions. Are you kidding me? Like, what did you do to my sister? And it's very cryptic. We don't really get a lot of answers on what happened, um, but they do reveal a lot of things. So the first thing they reveal is what is happening to the boys with the bees in their ears. They're called drones. And the bees in their ears kind of control them. There, I believe there is a type of bee that's like a worker bee called a drone or something like that. I will look it up. But they basically, when they, when these bees in their ears come out and they are activated, they serve the honey. So they're just kind of being like servants and stuff. They reveal something called the lace, which is their connected hive mind. It is their higher power as well as their hive mind. Once you have been initiated into the honeys and you are a part of them, you are a part of the lace. You are no longer your own person. You are a part of the lace and you are part of the sisterhood. Through the book Mars has kind of been able to connect to it a little bit like here and there in the way that you know Bria will ask a question and then you know he'll look into her eyes and they'll kind of ascend out of their bodies and become one with each other to kind of explore each other's minds and stuff and through this whole time Mars has really been able to manipulate it a little bit but he's never understood what it is. You know, it's explained, you know, the lace is the higher power. The lace is 
the means to the end. Like this is who we are. There is no oneness with us. We are the lace and the lace is us. And um, they also revealed that the honey that, you know, the blood red honey that they had given to, they had sold, it was sold to a specific old lady. They weren't selling it to um, just anybody. All of the other regular honey was being sold to regular people. But when certain people would walk up to the booth, they would give them this red honey. And they're like, this is called the umbral honey. And what this does is it connects you to the lace in like immediately. Like it's just kind of to re-up your power um, through the lace and stuff. And it's also revealed that the honeys are not a new generation. They are a descendants of a very old bloodline. Um, and not even a bloodline, just like an old system of like families and stuff. And Caroline was a part of it. And it's this old consciousness. So when these older ladies, it's specifically women, um, and then later, like, Mars, who's gender fluid, but it's specifically women who, they'll come back to Aspen for this jubilee to get this honey, and it'll last them a year, and it allows them to be more connected to the lace because they are outside of Aspen, and because Aspen is, like, the huge hive is there, and, you know, it's, you're just surrounded by nature, and you're disconnected from all devices and stuff. It's just easier to be consumed by the lace. Yeah, so that's what that is, and Mars obviously freaks out, you know, he, he gets kind of thrown into the lace. One of the, uh, honeys, like, puts some of the umbral honey on his gums and he's just kind of thrown into the lace and you know gets to be immersed in it. The writing in this book is absolutely gorgeous. It's almost very poetic in a very gruesome way at some points but it, it makes you really feel like you were ascended with Mars um, in just such like an unnatural way. It was so cool. So after this he's knocked out again and he wakes up in cabin h with the honeys and you know at first he's kind of like doing things as a collective with them he kind of falls into line without really meaning to with like their daily routine and stuff and then he realizes he wakes up and he realizes he's in the shower and he dries off and he puts his clothes on and he just walks out and nobody stops him um, they're, they try to like follow after him, but nobody really stops him from leaving. And so he goes into the cabin, the, the regular camp, goes to the cabin and there's nobody in the cabin except for one boy in the kitchen. And, you know, this boy catches him and is like, oh, like, where have you been? Like, like we were looking for you. And he's like, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, have you seen Wyatt? Because he wants to tell Wyatt because, you know, Wyatt saw the huge hive with him. He feels like Wyatt is the only person he can trust here. The boy's like, oh, he's playing poker. Like you want to go like play poker with us and whatever like he's over at the big cabin and Mars is like yeah okay sure and then they get outside and he realizes in the very beginning of the book Wyatt had said oh I'm so bad at poker I don't have the face for it and he realizes that this boy is a drone and he looks over and there's a bee in his ear so he tries to run away and more boys step out of the woods and like try to grab him and Wyatt ends up grabbing him and is like, I've got all this stuff, we need to run. So they run out of the um, camp and they make it just outside the property in this old rundown barn. And this whole time Wyatt and Mars have kind of been like flirting a little bit. They've kind of been like a little bit of a thing and whatever, but nothing really concrete. But here, you know, once they're safe and they're away, they start talking together about like, you know, Mars is very open and honest about how all of this is affecting him and affecting, like, the way he thought about Caroline, and he's just wondering, like, what did she go through before she died? Was she even herself before she died? You know, did this, did, did this lace corrupt her? Um, and Wyatt is, like, really sympathetic to it, and he's listening. And then they start making out together, and Mars goes to, like, pull his shirt off, um, Wyatt's shirt off and he does and then he puts his arms around his shoulders in the back and he feels like the scar and he's like what's that like are you okay and it doesn't feel like a, like a scar that's been healed um it's it's like a not a it's a healing wound almost Wyatt's like no don't even worry about it like I'm fine and then as they're kissing again Mars remembers that he caught someone in the back with his hive tool back in the very beginning of the book and it just kind of clicks together for him and he pushes Wyatt off and he's like you're a drone like what are you doing and Wyatt becomes not Wyatt anymore um, and he's not exactly a drone um, but he's definitely something else and this not Wyatt person just starts 
being really awful and like being very violent towards Mars and trying to kill him and being like your sister was weak and you are weak too and the Matthias bloodline needs to die and the last name of Mars is Matthias. So you know he attacks Mars um, and Mars is trying to get away and he manages to roll away from him but not until Wyatt grabs him and throws him off of the top of the hayloft with him and it's very much like when Caroline died again. Mars manages to flip them so Wyatt falls first and you know Mars hurts his leg and Wyatt is just like really hurt but Mars manages to get away and he's running away and he realizes as he's running that he's run right back into the aspen trees, he's right back on aspen property and this was probably Wyatt's plan the whole time. And Wyatt does catch up to him, he, he manages to make it as far as the marshy area over by where the hotel with the huge hive was because he was trying to like run and get help and Wyatt catches up to him and he pushes his head under, he like sits on top of him and pushes his head underneath the water of the swamp and starts drowning him. The honeys actually come to his rescue again and they pull him out of the water and they push Wyatt to the center of the pond or the like swamp with a bunch of bees like just circling him and like holding him in place and Bria pulls him out of the water and is like ready to kill Wyatt basically and Mars is like no like he's not himself he's a drone and she's like oh really okay so she starts like pushing him under the water enough so that just his head like just this part of his head is out of the water and it like pushes the bees that are inside of his body up out of his mouth and they start swirling around and there's something different about them than normal bees and it's called a splinter swarm and apparently the way this works within the lace is that only somebody who has the power of the honeys can create a splinter swarm by breaking off bits of them and like, I don't know, like imbuing hatred into it and it so it creates this like monstrous creature that you can possess somebody with to do your bidding outside of it. Yeah, so this splinter swarm is swarming around and Bria is like, okay, well whose is it? Somebody speak up because I can sense it's one of ours, but it's not mine and I can't tell whose it is and nobody speaks up. And so Bria starts, they start humming, like all the girls start humming. It's, it's a way that they kind of like harness their power and work together is they just start humming. And the splinter swarm like circles around Mimi, who has been there, I would say, the most for Mars, uh, aside from Bria, just like being by his side and helping him through the loss of his sister. And she just becomes like this awful person. And she's like, well, Caroline was weak. Caroline was awful. We should not have had her. She was, she was uh, crowned as queen of like the hive in the hotel and like the main consciousness of the lace. She was crowned as queen. And apparently the lace wants Mars to be the next queen and she holds the belief that you know Wyatt had had previously spoken about that you know the Matthias bloodline needs to die and they're all weak and she had managed to drive Caroline away enough and you know Caroline got killed in the process and now Mars is back and part I think it's also said that like Mimi it was Mimi's idea to invite Mars to Aspen to like give him some closure um, but it was only a ploy to kill Mars and not have him come home and because she wanted the queendom or she wants not not necessarily she did but she wanted somebody else to be queen and she's like well if nobody else wants it like I'll do it and Bria's like that's not how that works Mimi like you know that's not how that works and so the girls like rally around Mimi and they kill her because you know um corruption in the hive. There's actually a prophecy earlier on that Mimi read um, from a dis like a disfiguration in the honeycomb when she was showing Mars and Wyatt around. She they found a discol like a discoloration and like a disformity in the honeycomb and Mars like snuck after her and heard her talking to a couple of the other girls and she was like it was it was like read almost as a prophecy of like there's corruption within the hive and stuff so it was also like spreading discord and stuff and so we're at the point where I was like oh perfect Mimi was the one who was like causing all the problems except we've been bamboozled again 
Okay, so once Bria, once Mimi's dead, Bria is like, there is something else coming for you. You need to leave. You need to run. And so Mars does. Mars leaves and he manages to get as far as the town that's a little bit outside of Aspen and he goes to an Applebee's. And incidentally enough, he and his father had stopped at the same Applebee's on the way into Aspen. So he's like, wow, full circle. But he calls his parents and he's like, hey, can you come pick me up? They're like, yes, of course. So they, they start coming to pick him up. He goes to put his stuff in the car and in the back seat. And there's just like this big black bag in the back of the car. And he smells something really bad in it and like really familiar in it. And so he opens it and it's his dead sister's corpse. It, bleh, and once he finds it, his dad comes around the back and chloroforms him and knocks him out. He comes to in this huge church, like it's this huge church in the middle of nowhere, probably in the middle of Aspen, and he's encased in honeycomb again. All around him are all of these old society people from the honeys, from who are under the control of the lace. Not really under the control of the lace, but like in the proximity of the lace you know they they were all initiated into this place and the men are the drones like they they're the boys who were the drones and they've grown up and they've married one of the honeys and so they're also in this it's like this huge cult mars comes to and he's hanging from the ceiling in this honeycomb and his dead sister is on like the dais the dais beneath him they're going on and on about this is like the queen's coronation you know mars is is queen you know it's such a shame that caroline wasn't strong enough to do it but you know mars will be the stronger sibling and stuff like that and it's all these politics and stuff and mars is trying to fight it he's trying to like make eye contact with specifically the honeys from cabin h this year they are condemning bria for going against the lace and going against the will of their their like little organization because she tried to let Mars go. She tried to get Mars out but it backfired because Mars didn't know that his mom used to be a honey and was in this and they were in this like cult together. You know the ceremony takes place, everything happens and while Mars is in this in-between space between life and death almost as, as this power is like getting seeped into him um, he sees Caroline and they talk and Caroline is like, I knew this was going to happen. I knew they coronated me and it was against my will and I didn't want to and I knew I was going to fail. And I knew that if I failed, you were going to be their target next. And I didn't want that for you. So the reason I tried to kill you was because I didn't want that life for you. I know how hard it is and I know how hard it's going to be. And I didn't want that life for you. Um, and they have a really sweet moment together. <laughs> but it ends up working the coronation ends up happening and to seal it he has to spill blood and so the organization is full of rich people you know because aspen is full of rich people and they they're all corrupt he he realizes very quickly they're all corrupt the corruption within the hive is their greed because all they want is honey production and because their queen died you know their new queen wasn't doing so hot and caroline died um, you know, their honey production hadn't been well, and they send this umbral honey to hives all over the world. It's it's how they keep connected with the lace, like, as a whole. And, you know, they, they weren't doing so well, and all that's in it for them is the money. And, you know, the power that they can have in the world. Their, their main goal is to take over the world's politics with this. Stuff like that. And so he realizes... The, the corruption within the hive is greed and part of the reason he realizes this is because the honeys are behind him and they're asking him to help like to help them and he realizes it's because Bria is the one who he's supposed to kill in order to seal the deal and for a second it really seemed like he was gonna kill Bria and I was I was like screaming in my head like please don't please don't um, but he doesn't he ends up stabbing Wendy and he says something really funny too um, about like I don't know, like, I'm so gender fluid, I can't even hit right or something like that. Um, but he hits her in the shoulder, and so she goes down, but the blood is spilled, and it's done. And he basically banishes every single person except for the honeys, because they're the corrupt ones. They're the ones who are controlling these girls and, like, hanging their lives over their head, basically, and trying to control Mars. Like, even in just the five minutes that Mars has been queen, you know, they're trying to control him and be like, oh, you know, like, we know what's best for you, like... 
you're going to be such a great queen. You're going to have such good honey production and all this stuff. Um, and, you know, it doesn't go their way. And so they're banished. And eventually, you know, they go back to the honeys and uh, Mars go back to, you know, Cabin H and Aspen. And Wendy is taking a leave of absence because she's been wounded. And um, now Mars is there. Mars is like a force to be reckoned with because not only is he queen it's a very different symbiotic relationship with not only all of the people within the lace but also the lace itself um it's it's very much like he has the power of the lace and the lace has the power through him and so not only is he connected to all of these girls but he also is a part of the lace now like it's very inseparable and so like the power that he has through the power that he has he's able to orchestrate his parents house burning down and they die in it. Um, so I think revenge is exacted there. <laughs> but yeah, so the book ends after he's been queened and it kind of sets up like the differences in Aspen now. Like the honeys are a lot more relaxed, a lot freer. He feels more like himself than he ever has. Um, and you know, in the very end there's a scene where Wyatt, um, who is obviously traumatized from being controlled and trying to kill somebody. Um, he's he's also very deeply afraid of, of Mars now because Mars is this otherworldly entity. Mars is no longer human. And, you know, that that's very scary. <laughs> so Wyatt approaches Mars and is like, I fixed it. And Mars is like, what did you fix? And he pulls out the sundial that his sister had tried to kill him with because in the process of her trying to smash his head in with it, it got broken, obviously. And he brought it with him to try and connect a piece of a puzzle of why did she use the sundial? It's never revealed. It's very blatantly. He's like, this is, I know many of the mysteries of this world now, but I will never know this mystery. Wyatt has taped it back together and Mars just kind of smiles and he's like, you can keep it, you know, like, I don't need it anymore, you can have it. And this is the first time Wyatt has even come up to him and because every single time Mars, you know, they, they come within vicinity of each other, Mars will kind of extend an olive branch and be like, hi. And Wyatt either runs away or just like does not respond. Um, but this is the first time Wyatt has said any words to him. And the closing words, this isn't the complete end. I, um, this is probably like from the last minute and a half of the audiobook. The other stuff is if you haven't read the book and you don't really understand the symbolism that's used for like as Mars is speaking through the lace, it doesn't really make any sense so I didn't include it. Um, but the final paragraph or a couple paragraphs is I let myself wonder what Wyatt sees. I know he doesn't see me. I know because when I catch myself in the vanity mirror or see my face stretched in the curved faucet of the sink as I do dishes, I don't see me either. Whoever I'm looking at, they seem happy. At home, even. But they aren't me. Where does the hive end, and where do I begin? But yeah, that was The Honeys by Ryan Lasala. So I know that, um, especially with Cameron Post, I wanted to talk about the, um, oh, and Anne of Greenville. Um, I mostly talked about, like, the different themes in terms of, like, social and political things. Um, I don't really want to do that with this book. I... I don't know. <laughs> this... I read Hell Followed With Us um, back in May or something, um, and that book spoke to me on such a huge level. I want to do that book, but I want to do it when I feel like I can do it justice. And I feel like, you know, I'm only a few videos in, I don't feel like I can do it justice right now. And I want to dedicate that time, you know, this time until I feel like that. To just get better at what I'm doing. Um, so my closing thoughts are um, I love this new genre of queer horror of just gender f***ery. It's so cool to me because I have been exploring my gender a lot um, just over the few past years and I've settled on a gender and that might change you know sexuality and gender identity are as fluid as water um they they can change and they can shift and it can it can change with any like part of your life that you know one label might not fit and no label might fit i personally if i were to like label every single individual part of myself i would have like a whole list of things and i do but i personally identify as queer um, because i just feel like it encompasses all of the changes that may happen in my life that you know, it just holds the space and accommodates for it. 
Um, but I love the it's just been in these two, uh, Hell Followed With Us and The Honeys, where, you know, it makes being trans and being queer and being, like, gender f***ed just so beautifully monstrous. I love it. I, I think that, you know, transgender people and just being, identifying anything other than cisgendered is so demonized. I feel like we're taking it back by by creating these characters as just these monstrous beings that are beautiful in their own way, you know. Um, in this, uh, Mars becomes the queen and, you know, he's not anything normal anymore and it's in such a f***ed way that it's just absolutely gorgeous. The imagery of it is beautiful. I don't know. I, I don't personally think there's anything monstrous in being queer, but I love that we can turn characters into monstrous beings and I just resonate so much with it. I, I think it's beautiful because, you know, humans can be monstrous, you know? I, being a human is such an abstract experience. I don't think any one thing can make us a certain thing, but... It, it's just so beautiful. It's so empowering to me personally. I, I just love taking the the views of others um, as like, this is fucked up and being like, yes, but it can be so much more fucked up. Um, I just love it. It's, it, uh, I love it so much. And another thing too is that there, the sense of community in this book, it, it was displayed in such different ways. You know, it was displayed in the the, the like the net of a spider you know you can fall into it and you're just a part of it now um, it's also set in the intentional way of you know you are a part of this thing but you it isn't very intentional and you find comfort in it um, and you know it did like evoke peace you know when when Mars was finally the queen and like a part of it you know they were like I don't know where I end and the hive begins but there was nothing startling about that there was no fear in it of of that and I feel like the community of just LGBT people the people that I know and the people that I have known and the people that I will come to know um there's just such peace in in finding the sameness of it and I feel like a lot of times we run on a very similar wavelength um and you know people are all different and we all have different ideals and and stuff like that but I know that if I go into a store and I see another person flagging as queer like I just find some sort of like commisery with them I I feel safer in their presence and I felt like that was really displayed here uh, just with the lace and stuff because it was it was dangerous you know it it was scary but it, it was also so peaceful for the people because Bria said in in one of the things and Sierra too they just said like we we recognize when somebody needs something and we don't ask we just give and I feel like we just need a lot more of that um god I'm getting choked up <laughs> but yeah god I love this book so much it it this and how followed with us really hit home for me I think I, I just, like I said, I love the monstrous part of being trans. I love the monstrous part of having an identity and, and finding solace in my identity and having the courage in my identity to stand up for it. And, um, you know, in a black and white view, there's nothing monstrous about being trans or anything like that, but there's monstrosity in being human. And I'm proud to admit that, you know, I'm a little monstrous. I like that. <laughs> The song that I picked is called Kill the Sun by Mother Folk, um, specifically for these lyrics. Um, if you do listen to the song, I, I wasn't able to really find a song that I felt fit as much um, as this book deserved. There might be another song later on that I might add, um, but this was, I went through my different playlists just extensively. Um, but specifically I, I picked this song because of these lyrics. Uh, I think it's the bridge. Um, it says, in spite of all your love, you fear what I'll become. If this is killing me, you can't be the one to tell me. I don't know. I just felt like that fit. Uh, Mother Folk also has a lot of different songs that kind of give the same vibe of just like awkward otherness. Um, and just like, they're just kind of out there and I really like that. I, I really like their discography. It's really good. Um, I didn't choose an Etsy shop for this one. I didn't really choose a shop for this one. 
Um, I just personally think you should support your local <laughs> apiaries. You should you should go find a farmer's market and buy local honey. Um, not only is it good for your allergies, uh, depending on what climate you like live in, um, but it also supports local businesses and local bees. Um, you know, and we need to save the honeybees, <laughs> even if they might just like mind control us and whatever. Um, but yeah, I really hope you enjoyed this book. I really do recommend you read it. Uh, it was incredible, but yeah. I hope you have a great rest of your week and if you want to find me I am on Instagram at runny underscore reads. I'm also on Tumblr at gravitationally challenged rabbits. You can find me there. Like I've said before my Tumblr is just kind of whatever so if you don't like my Tumblr you don't really have to follow me. I just kind of post whatever I feel like. Um, but yeah if you want to subscribe go ahead and click the subscribe button but if you don't I I'm really glad to have you. I, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. Yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your week. Bye.